Okay, we get started. Um, I would like to welcome all of you to today's edition of our distinguished lecture series on the topic, what is data science? I think that's a very interesting, very complex questions, question and we can actually discuss it for hours. This distinguished lecture series is organized by, by the research, research network Data Science at the University of Vienna, which is basically a cooperation of several faculties. And as Dean of the Faculty of Computer Science, I would like to use this opportunity to tell you a little bit about our faculty. So this is a young faculty, has been established not so long ago, only 2004. We're currently 28 professors, 15 research groups, and we have research focus areas which are listed here. One of those, as you can see, is data science. And therefore, of course, we as a faculty are also very interested in that question, what is data science? And I'm, I'm sure we'll hear very interesting input today. If you want to know more about the faculty, then here's a quick link. And as I mentioned before, this is today's talk is organized in cooperation with the Research Network Data Science at Uni Vienna. This is even younger, so this has been established in 2018. The principal idea is was to, to establish a platform for fostering the interaction between these different disciplines which have to be involved when data science ideas are discussed. So several faculties are involved here. Um, and one of the ways how this is currently organized is that each PhD student in this area has two supervisors, one in an application domain with data science questions and one in math, statistics or computer science. Um, currently application domains in this research network which are worked on are social sciences, medicine, digital humanities, but I think there are many other examples um, which are also considered. There is a speaker, Thorsten Müller, of this uh, research network, who unfortunately cannot be here today. Philip Gross is one of the vice speakers, and Claudia Plant is the second vice speaker. And with that, I would like to hand over to her and ask her to introduce our speaker today. Thank you very much, Wilfried, for the introduction. And I want to welcome you all, uh, students, colleagues, everybody, uh, to this talk. And I'm very happy that we can do it now, because actually we planned it uh, to do in 2020, and it did not work out. And so we have a del delay of about two years. But now I'm very proud and I'm very happy to introduce you, my guest, Anastasia Eilermaki. So, Anastasia, when I should tell something about you, it's really, really hard for me to select among all the awards that you won, uh, the, the most important ones. Uh, so for me, to, to put it in a nutshell, to be very brief, Anastasia is certainly one of the major people who have influenced modern database research in the past decades. And uh, so currently she is a professor of computer science at the EFDFL Lausanne. And also she is, she is a co-founder of the Raw Labs company. That's a uh, company who uh, works on infrastructures for real-time analytics for big and heterogeneous data. And you see this topic is also very much interesting and connected to research we are doing in the data science research focus area of our faculty and of course also in, in my group. She did her PhD in uh, the year 2020 in computer science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And she was uh, also then um, at the Carnegie Mellon University for quite some time. And during that time, I first met uh, Anastasia. It was around the year 2005 or so. And since um, then, she really was really an inspiring uh, meeting we had at that day. 
And therefore, I thought about inviting you uh, to this distinguished lecture series and to see you again after all these years. Uh, it makes me very happy. And um, yeah, and, uh, nevertheless, I want to mention some of the awards you achieved. So um, the NSF Career Award, the European Young Investigators Award, and the ERC Consolidated Grant. And also, she won two prestigious awards for her overall research from the two most important conferences in the field of databases, which is the ACM SIGMOL conference and the VLDB conference. But I don't want to eat more uh, up of the time. I just want to leave the floor to Anastasia, and I'm sure she will give us today a very interesting answer to her question, what is data science? Thank you, and looking forward. So, hi everyone. Um, thank you very much for the invitation, Claudia, Christian, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I want to talk to you not about myself, actually, but about the work of my group and um, some more stuff. I would like to know what is data science. I don't really know yet. Every person I ask has a different answer. I always thought of data science as being a very, um, you know, smart set of people, a, a set of very smart people rather, um, who can combine knowledge in statistics and, and data management. So I'm, I know I'm a very, I'm thinking of it in a very simplistic way, thinking of it this way, but I'm an engineer, so I like to decompose the problem into smaller problems and solve it. So um, today I'm going to discuss a bit the data management side, okay? And I hope that each one of you, which prob who probably, and you should perceive your science differently than the person next to you, because that's what makes you unique as a scientist. I hope that each one of you will identify with a, a part of this and then we'll have things to talk about. So um, the, the title of my talk is From Lots of Code to No Code, playing a little bit with words there because code has been the central focal point of everything that we do in data management, but also in, in other areas in computer science. We build the code and then we, we ask people to adapt to the code that we build. We build a system, the system that we build has a certain kind of coded smart intelligence and then we tell people you know here use the user interface of the system or use the api of the system that says come to us we don't go to you to the users we don't go to the data it has to come to the system right you see this view because we have built the intelligence so if you want to take advantage of this intelligence you first of all need to know what our system can do and then you need, if you like what we can do and you want it, then you will have to conform to the interface or language or whatever it is that we use. So this is how we've been building systems. I think that this applies to all systems and also the rest of the ideas I will discuss. But since I am a database person, I know how to build database systems, so I use database system as an example. Okay, and uh, more importantly, in these talks, I'm, I'm going to focus more on analytics. Analytics is a fancy word for what we used to call in the 80s decision support systems. It's basically questions that drill into the data and try to get answers that are not obvious from just looking at the data. You have to filter the data through multiple levels to get the answer. So my world is... Um, uh, mostly academic. I'm at EPFL. I, uh, I founded uh, Raw Labs about, oh, maybe seven years ago with uh, my then postdoc. Now he is CEO of the company. Uh, I'm the uh, chair of the, um, advisor of, the, of the board of directors. And we're, we together are trying to give all of this research out to the world to use it through this commercial offering. But all of the research I talk about, most, it's mostly academic research, and it's all open through papers. 
So um, let's see. I mean, the, 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 the thing that I think makes us move here is the evolution, is change, right? In the world of data management, we see change in three dimensions. We see change in the dimension of data, and this means that the data grows. I mean, everybody has seen, has, has seen a version of this curve someplace, right? Um, this one goes up to 2025, the one I'll show later goes only up to 2020, but it doesn't matter. It has the same aggressively exponential shape, okay? And the data grows in size. What does this even mean that data grows, data grows in size? Who cares really, right? It only is important to us if the data is interesting. So we care also about the other Vs of big data. We care about velocity, we care about veracity, sources, geographical distribution, all that stuff. So data, but th this is changing. Every year, all these numbers are different than last year's. Okay, maybe they are higher, maybe they are lower, but they're different. Then the workloads are changing. Every year, every season even, you get different kinds of applications. Now here's the fun part. Application, we're used to think of it as something that goes to the database system for service and then comes back with the data and does whatever the user needs. That's the application. Well, the news is that actually all of this ecosystem of the application does two additional things that are important to us computer scientists. First of all, different applications impose different access patterns to the data. Therefore, the, if you have two applications that are different, they impose different access patterns to the data, each application gets totally different performance from the database system, although it's the same database system. So one of them may love the performance, the other one may hate the performance. Think about, for those of you who are database-minded, think about transactions and queries. Two different applications, the same database system, they can get totally different performance depending on how the database system has been engineered. Okay. So, and also the other side is that the applications themselves, they talk they are also, um, uh, their performance is also very much influenced by the capabilities of the hardware. So multiple levels down from the application, there's the silicon, there's the processor, memory subsystem, storage, hierarchy, all that stuff. And that hardware is changing at the same time. So we have totally different storage systems across the board. Um, very deep storage hierarchies, caches, memories, um, flash devices, disks, uh, tapes. Don't think the tape is away. If you think the tape has gone away, take a, a walk at CERN. Okay, the tape is very much there. It's a booming industry. They're small, they're cute, they are fantastic. They're extremely fast if you do sequential scan. So it's extremely, all of this is extremely important, but what's important is that this is changing. So now the hardware is changing as well. You have CPUs, which I'm going to be denoting with blue, and then you have other devices, accelerators. The most popular accelerator is, anybody? What? GPUs, thank you very much. GPUs. So with green, I'm going to be denoting GPUs. But what I'm saying holds for all the other accelerators, right? There's FPGAs, there's LPUs, there's all that stuff. So this is a very fast evolving world and one asks themselves, how are you going to give this world a piece of code right there in the middle and tell them you have to continuously adapt to my, you know, godly software? Not going to happen, okay? This is where today data management faces its most critical challenges. And here's one of the graphs I mentioned. You can completely ignore the time scale because it's going to continue forever. The New Year's EMC survey has until 2025, and it's exactly the same curve. This is the most aggressively growing curve ever. And if you want to see how aggressively, for those of you who've done computer architecture, you might have learned about the Moore's law, which is our ability to pack double the number of transistors every 18 months in the same area of a die. So if uh, I did, I crunched some numbers from the Winter Corp survey and some other reports, and I tried to put fit on this graph the ability that we have with our cargo and software processing technology today to translate data into useful information, right? So that's not going to be more slow. That's going to be what we can do with the more slow, right? And this is what we can do. This is horrible. This is the worst return on investment 
I can think of. This says that there is a growing window of data that are right only, that we, we never see, we never read it. We collect it, we pay handsome money for all the machines that collect the data, and we never read it. And it's true. Granted, mo most of this data is the fastest growing kind of data, which is machine generated data. Okay? So sensors, door open, door closed, machine open, machine on, machine off, uh, routers, logs, unstructured, right? But still, this data is being collected, is being recorded. You want to do something with it, maybe, maybe not. What's worse is that a third of that data, about a third of that data, is inaccurate in some way. And the in some way is there for, in, on purpose, because inaccuracy of data is a very subjective thing. What Claudia thinks is right, I may think is wrong. What Christian thinks is enough, I may think is not enough. The number of decimal points, the normalization between two X-ray machines at the hospital. Okay, so inaccuracy is a very subjective thing. So data cleaning is a huge problem. And I'm gonna talk to you about it, but there is a huge effort to clean and store interesting data so that we reduce the amount of data that we just simply can't use. And also enhance our effort to really process the data more and more and more efficiently with smarter algorithms so that we can bridge this gap somehow and we stop and we improve our return of investment, but the current situation is actually pretty grim. There's a lot of data that's not being read, bred. and if you see it horizontally, all of this 50-fold growth that we have in the, with data, and 50 might be a small number, right? Astronomy, for example, has produced more data in 2022 than it has produced in the 400 years of the existence of the science together, right? So it's a huge growth. So all this growth, should make us more powerful. Instead, it makes us humble. We end up looking for the diamond in the hay. And that's really hard to do. It impedes the discovery. So what are we, why is that, does that happen? And I'm going to give a very, very simple reason. It's because of data preparation. It's because of this story that I said in the beginning that we're, we're, we're building code and then we expect everybody to come and bow to the code. Okay, here's what we do. We build code, and that code can ingest data, transform it from its original format here to something that the database understands. It's structured, okay? And in today's data um, warehouses or data lakes, you call it ingestion, right? So there's different ways to, to code, but this is the transformation, ETL. You might have heard extract, transform, load. This is essentially the preparation, the transformation of the data in a form, in a physical form that does two things. One is that it agrees with how the code expects to see the data. And the other one is that it harmonizes all these different formats of data because data comes in very different formats, right? You have CSV data, which is table data, like Excel sheets, for example. You have JSON, which is hierarchical data, like the, you know, or HTTP, right? Um, you have text, you have unstructured blogs, uh, you have images, you have all sorts of data, right? So you need to harmonize those. Why? Because you want to be able to ask questions. You want to be across all these data. You have to be able, for example, as a company to say, um, combine all the uh, latest web logs that I have uh, of the accesses of my customers with the history of such kinds that I found in the database someplace in the web and with my Dropbox Excel sheet where I keep my customer's information and tell me which is the city that gives me most of the hits on my site. That requires joining, putting together data that are totally different formats, right? And to be able to do this with one software that you have prepared for this, the first thing you need to do is harmonize those formats together physically, right? Otherwise, it's apples and oranges. Otherwise, you need a different system for each one of these. And then you have to harmonize the answers at the top level, which is a lot more work and it's more tedious and sometimes it can't even be done. So you load the data. Then you have to clean the data, which means taking the data literally, filtering it through some pre-specified error factors, 
and then producing a clean version of the data. And you know, you may have errors like, for example, um, uh, I, uh, you know, Petro lives in Vienna and I live in Vienna, I wish. Uh, and, and you know, we live in the same neighborhood, but our, our um, zip code is different. So how can that work, right? That can't be, right? So there's something wrong there. So we try to find other people in the same neighborhood and see which is the zip code that they use and correct the incorrect digit, right? And that's the easy one. The harder one is the ones I mentioned before. But then you clean the data, you produce a clean version, and then you tune the database, meaning that you actually create additional data structures like materialized views, indexes, and that good stuff to enhance performance for data access when you access data that's needed by a lot of people. So all of this is work, it's preparation. I haven't, I haven't allowed questions yet, right? I received the data today, tomorrow I clean, the day after I tune and it goes on and on and on. And only then, after I've done this preparation, then I can ask my question. And when I ask my question, the system starts planning the execution. What does this even mean? This means that the system has compute and software resources which can be combined in different ways to produce different ways to answer the question. So depend, or, or the order of filters is one, like filter first the CSV, then the JSON, or the other way around. You see what I'm saying? So this is called query optimization or planning. And this is a huge process. Mind you, I still haven't started executing the query, the question, right? I'm still, it's like trying to go on vacation, spending months planning the vacation, and then you even overrun the time that you had for vacation, right? It's, it's like this. And then finally run and get the answer. And the biggest problem is that this is not only expensive co computationally, it takes a long time, and it turns out that data science people who are hired to run really elaborate machine learning, you know, queries or statistical models on the data, Instead, they spend their time cleaning the database, indexing, tuning, setting up, doing most of their time is spent in preparing our systems. Okay, so this is a problem. And when I was, um, uh, when I first went to EPFL in 2008, I was hired there. Um, I was at CMU before. We had worked with many scientific databases but I had never worked with doctors or neuroscientists. And when I went to EPFL two years later, um, the, there were the, the, the Blue Brain project there, which is a project done by neuroscientists and me and a bunch of other people from Germany and from Brussels and from Greece and from other places, we got together and we wrote a flagship project, which was then awarded, it's called the Human Brain Project. And some of you might have heard it. And there I was doing, I mean, quite a few very interesting projects working with very smart doctors and neuroscientists. One of them was to actually build a federated system, a federated network of hospitals in Europe. And um, the idea was to be able to send queries to the hospitals and get back aggregated information about symptoms of patients. And the idea was to be able to create from repeated such queries, to create what we called biological disease signatures. This means essentially the coupling of measurements, clinical measurements and biomarkers um, by using four dimensions of patient data. Clinicians, for example, will record symptoms um, or lo memory loss aspects or pa the patient's functional capacity. Biologists will record protein levels. Geneticists will record levels of genetic um, variants, common genetic variants, so uh, they will record mutations. Um, and then you have radiologists, which will record um, in, in their labs they will record the volumetric changes in the gray versus white matter or beta amyloid levels, which can lead to Alzheimer's. So all of this information coming together, and you can see the relationship with the system that I, that I showed to you before, right? We can see the relationship. All of this information is here on the left-hand side. You want to bring it together, and what you can do with it is create a signature 
like a string. It's very simple, it's like a string like this one that says that if a patient comes in and has this different um, uh, uh, numbers or, you know, this different uh, data in their, across those four sections, across those four different dimensions, they probably have a specific variant of Alzheimer's. That is the holy grail. It's extremely powerful. Okay? So creating those signatures. The Tel Aviv, through the course of this research, the Tel Aviv University was able to identify five previously unknown versions, versions of Alzheimer's. This is tremendous. This is the personalized medicine, or precision medicine, as it's called, is rooted in these kinds of discoveries. But the challenge is real-time integration of heterogeneous data. So bear with me for a moment here. So I show you the actual data for this, right? So you've got your table on the top left, where, which is basically the clinical information about the patients, right? So this is, this is right here. And this is their age, symptoms, and all so sorts of stuff, okay? Then you've got a binary array, uh, which is, this, this maps the patient's brain in a coordinate space and keeps measurements of gray matter volume for each coordinate. And then you've got a de derived file from this binary. It's a byproduct of the imaging file, um, which is a JSON file associating the gray matter volume measurements with the areas of the brain, such as the hippocampus, for instance. So what you want to produce, like one step down from the previous um, slide in the abstraction hierarchy, you want to produce this. You want to produce this, this, this signature. That's the signature you want to produce. And that you can feed into any database system as a query if you can harmonize all this data. So with me so far. Yes? Good? Questions? So how are we going to do this? Okay, we have a database system. This is the actual query. And I have many examples, by the way. This is um, fancy because it's clinical and, you know, we can relate. But, but I have also exam uh, other examples from other projects like semantic spam detection and things like that. So there's tons of examples out there where you have to combine data. So classical database, this is your SQL query. And for those of you not familiar, it's just the query that we use. It's a declarative way to tell the data management system what we want to, to see from the data and which data, how it should filter the data. So you don't tell the system how to implement the filtering, you just tell them what kind of filtering you want. It's a logical declarative way to, to, to address the system. So here is, the system is right here, right? And then it will load all of the data into a unified format, and you can already appreciate that if a system is a relational system, which means that it deals with tables mostly, and it has to load the hierarchy, it will lose information, because it's going to be highly inefficient. And that's like the tip of the iceberg, because it gets worked with other formats. And then the optimizer will say, okay, this is the, the we'll, we'll examine all possible plans, and we'll say, okay, this is the plan, so I'm going to first scan the, the file, then I'm going to filter it using this, um, this, this uh, predicate here. I'm going to only pass the information that satisfies this predicate. And then I'm going to move on and I'm going to scan the other file and I'm going to join the two. But the preparation, you see, the preparation is right here. The preparation, the cost for the preparation of the data follows the exponential curve. The more data you have, the more time you will have to spend before you're able to ask and get the answer to the question. So because you have to clean and restructure. I'm going to stay for a moment on the cleaning part. What do we do today? Today, we clean data by taking the database, knowing what errors we need to clean, passing it through a software, creating another copy of the database with changed values. That's how we clean data. Some systems can do this in real time, meaning that if you specify the errors, you can do it for chunks of the data if you pre-specify. So, so now, for example, clean the patient's file because I'm about to use it or clean the other file from the internet. What we wanted to do was not only to clean in real time, but in a much more efficient way than file by file, than, than table by table. We also wanted to be able to specify what errors we wanted to do. Sort of like transformations 
in, in general, not just cleaning the data, right? So what we did is that we created an algebra and all of our work is based on, on this kind of mathematical infrastructure. So we created an algebra and that algebra can very simply express what kind of errors a user might be able to mean, but it's all composable. So a user can compose this error. And what's fun about it is that you saw the query in the previous slide here, right? I can actually put this stuff in the query. I can actually add in the where clause, or I can, sorry, I have another clause that's called clean, and then I can add here um, uh, different ways to filter the data in addition to the filtering that happens just to get the answer. So think about embedding operators in the query plan, embedding different things which clean in real time, but they clean in the way that's specified in the query. So it's completely real time and automatic here. So this is what this does. So it doesn't interfere, it doesn't need preparation. You do it in real time through this common algebra. And also because this way you can identify the errors, but we don't know how to clean the errors because think of the zip codes example, right? If we need to see a lot more zip codes in order to find out whether the one registered in my address is correct or the one registered in Petra's address is correct, if we need to see more zip codes, we need more data than what the query needs. So we coupled this algebraic way to express the errors with a planning, an executor that takes the plan and relaxes the execution, it means that the execution might need to bring up X data, it might bring plus 20% data, whatever more it needs in order to clean the values at the same time. Okay, all of this is in papers at Sigma and VLDB, so I'm saying very high level ideas here. I can point to you the papers if you're interested. So we have a language, it's called CleanM, Clean and a capital M for CleanM, and the relax, coupled with the relaxed query execution, it allows you to clean the data to ask a dirty database for a, a, a query and receive a clean answer through the specification and, and, the, uh, and the relaxed query execution. Of course, still the problem remains, which is the data variety. And I have a slide here to show that this is a report that says variety is 70% of the problem for most people, the data format variety. But at the same time, this is something that a lot of systems just shove under the rug. They say, ah, oh, you know, we have to harmonize the data first. And that's very expensive. It's also impossible to do anything else because it's impossible to create a data system, a code for all data and for all applications. Why? Think of it, I mean, for those of you who code for a living, right? You want to write a join algorithm. You want to write a scan algorithm for an indexing algorithm for tables. And you want to write an, the same algorithm, the same logic, but for JSON files, for hierarchies. You're going to write different programs. Okay? Each one is these little circles that I showed here. Right? So all these filters, if I don't have this harmonization here, all this, this filter is going to be different if I'm navigating JSON, it's going to be different if I'm navigating CSV. So what we've been doing so it's impossible to create one system, which makes it extremely hard to think, to continue living in this world where we have to write the code first. So this is where we go from lots of code to no code. So the premise here is, and what we did, is that we don't write any code ahead of time. We write the mathematical expressions of what we want to do, and when time comes and the query arrives and we know what the user wants to do, we know how the application wants to use the data and which data it needs to use, then we generate the code. So that's the secret. Okay. What do we need? We need two things. 
we need ways to go to the data which are similar to the plug I bring with me when I go to England or to the United States. So it's the plugins that you have in your browser, right? It's the same thing. So we have ways to understand the pre-specified plugins so that we can, we know how to go into the CSV file or the binary file and navigate, okay? But these are not active, these are passive. And only when the query needs those files, that's when they are activated. And then we have an infrastructure here, which is a full-blown functional language that creates algebraic expressions of what people want to do, what the query needs to do. So the user can write still SQL, it gets translated to the functional language, that gets translated to algebra, and that's that. And then when we have the algebraic form of the query, we um, we translate it into, um, into, into essentially an expression, as I said, um, which is really used in order to be able to optimize it, so it will give you bags or lists or any of that stuff. We use monoids, we use category theory, monoid comprehensions, and they're very simple in their simplicity, they're very composable, right? So if you need duplicate elimination, for example, you will use sets, and you will specify the result as a set in the algebra. And then we use code generations, mostly with LLVM, and the code generation will make this expression efficient on the target um, machine, on the target client. So the code is written here. It's not written there. And I'll give you an example in a minute, but here's our previous query. We have the plan, and then we have the files, but we don't have a database system. Instead, what we do is that we go to access the source files through the plugins. We find what data we need. We code generate the access paths to the interesting data into the files. Then we code generate the rest of the query. So all of this is code that's written after the query has been submitted. And then, so, so right now, we can already answer this query. What's the problem? Why didn't we do this from the very beginning? It's because it's slow. The reason why we prepare the data is because it's gonna be very slow if we don't. You can't go and parse and tokenize a CSV every time. Well, yes, it's gonna be slow the first time. But then the second time, it's like when I go to Crete and I've never been there before, I explore and I take my sweet time. But then I note down the, the good bars and the good restaurants and the good hotels. And the next time, I go directly. Okay, so that's what we do, right? Keep useful info into caches and, 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 and uh, we call them positional maps, caches. We have a, a very elaborate cache learning scheme. And the data to query time is zero because in this system, you can ask a question and then you can immediately after you receive the data, regardless of what data it is. So RAW is the system that we have at RAW Labs and it's a platform that allows you to do all this stuff. This is the kernel of the platform and then of course it offers different digital transformation services. But Basically, what we do, the user asks a query, the query gets broken down in pieces, one per source. Then we use the, the code generation infrastructure to code generate the access paths. And that way, the users can think of their data as a unified database without preparation. And while you're running, you remember the code that you've generated and the data that you've used, and you can use it again. So we find that users after the fifth, sixth query, they run exclusively from the caches. The interesting thing is that you can think of it as a virtual data lake, right? Except you never, the user never sees it, never has to maintain it. And even if it goes away, it's fine. Nobody lost anything. It's just for performance, okay? So the hospitals really like this because um, they don't like copying the data, so this system never copies the data anywhere, never loads the data anywhere. This is completely incomprehensible to any naked eye, right? So, and also the data doesn't get locked into the vendor. So if you run Oracle, the data, you have to go through Oracle to access your data. 
with this kind of philosophy, the data can be accessed by many systems at the same time because the database system doesn't own the data. So it's like you have this blanket, this data virtualization layer that any application that you may have can see the data thinking that it, it's in the format that it wants, right? So you present the data differently for, to each application. So this is the idea about the data harmonization and we've been working on that for a while. And in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about applications and hardware. Any questions thus far? So I think I'm going to move on. So you can, so I need you to see the pattern here, right? I am a master procrastinator, right? I don't like doing too much too soon, okay? I like to do things at the last minute because like a good database person, I think that's where I have all the data, okay? Don't do it for exams, okay? That's not a good idea for exams. It's only a good idea when, for database software, okay? So, remember this theme, and now start thinking this way. Start thinking every static decision I make, right? Can I make it later? Do I need more data? This is how you avoid if then else. This is how you avoid huge, huge case statements, right? In your, in your code. So, the second game changer I, I, I promised is the applications. And I'm gonna just say a few things of what we do in that domain. I have to tell you that there's a huge body of work from us and from other people, obviously, in this just-in-time, real-time thing, and, um, you know, uh, ecosystem. But we're working on, on these things, we're working on the applications also, because I've always been annoyed by the inefficiency of the ETL world, where if you have a supermarket, if you have a, a, an enterprise, you always have the operational part, and then you have the executive part. And the operational part is the one that the transactions come in, that you bought pampers and coffee, right, and all that stuff. And the transactions go in there, and then there is this multi-billion dollar industry that's called DTL, and it takes that, that data, and every now and then, every five minutes, every 10 minutes, every day, depending on the demands of the other side, takes it, transforms it, drops some, uh, some columns, reorganizes some other columns, creates aggregates, does data cubes, things like that, and copies it over to a different database that's used for analytics. You see this in the industry in many forms, what I see, so for example, is what I just said before as an example, but also I went to a bank once and they needed to, to run a, an experiment. We were working together and they said, oh, but it's going to take about a week from, for, for IT to extract a copy from the operational database, which I can use for this experiment. UBS, um, someone um, um, that I, I was working with told me that UBS which is one of the biggest banks in, in Switzerland, spends about 1.2 billion a year to maintain copies of the data, okay? This is a lot of money, okay, to maintain copies. And if I take a copy of the data for my experiment or for my decision-making progress process, um, I may never, I may forget about it. Most of the time I do, right? There's a lot of data debris. So this is the problem with copying data. And, the, the, but, but, and there, there's two dimensions to this problem that we're working on. One is that the number of queries used to be, we used to call analytics as the non-concurrent part. We have thousands or millions of transactions per second. At the same time, we have like 10 queries, right? Now we have thousands of queries. What do we do when we have many queries in a system? We take one, we run it. We take the next one, we run it. First come, first serve, right? But that creates repetition of work. A lot of queries have common work. Joins might be the same across many queries. There's a, a, a big part of what we do, uh, research, of the research that we do, that's called multi-query optimization. It's essentially the idea of taking many queries that came together in a system and creating a plan that looks not like a tree, but like a bush which allows for common parts to be executed only once. But that's difficult because how many of these are you going to get? 
And what kind of plan? And the planning is extremely hard computationally to do when you're in execution time, the clock is ticking. So instead, we created this, this work um, that, that basically says that we're not gonna do anything from the beginning, but if we have queries that are all together, so for example, here I show two queries, one is here and one's here, and that little bow tie, it's a join. It's something that brings two, two sources together and creates one string, okay, based on some common numbers there or, or strings. So, so what you want is to join R and S sources and then join T together with the result and then U. But here you see that there's quite a bit of, of commonality here because U might go, I think I did. Okay, U might, if you move U down here, you might be able to, 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 um, to read it only once. In general, in query plans, the reading, the most, um, the most costly reading, and uh, the most costly part of the query plan, the one that takes the most time, is the one that is at the bottom of the tree, because that's when you deal with a lot of data. At the higher levels of a plan, you have filtered most of the data out, so you deal with less and less volumes of data, smaller and smaller volumes. So if you have queries, that are, have commonalities, you need to find a way to, to do the common work once. And what we do is that we take all of these plants and there it's little um, uh, uh, round, it's little yellow round is one plant. Take all of these plants and consider them, but don't consider them for the entire volume of data that you have here. Consider them for parts of the data. This way, if you make a mistake, or if you find that this plan is not good, you haven't spent your entire time on a big data set. You know it from the beginning. So we break the data into what we call splits, and then we run different plans for different data. And then, uh, so for, uh, in the beginning, we run one plan for, for the first part of data, and then another plan for the first part of data, and then another plan for the, first part, uh, the, the next part of data, and so on and so forth. And what plan we're going to run, run for every split of the data depends on how well the previous ones have gone and what, how much data we have to run more. So eventually, we end up with plans that, for the most of the time of the query execution, that are very efficient for all of the queries that we have at that time in the system. In the beginning, we might be inefficient, but we converge. It's like dynamic optimization. We converge in execution time, during execution time, to the, um, to the uh, optimum. So we have here trial and error, essentially, finding better and better and more sharing decisions than any of the previous algorithms because we do it in real time when we have all the data in our hands. But then this is a query part. So we have thousands of queries, we can take advantage of common work. What are we gonna do about the fact that transactions are on the left-hand side, as I showed you before here, are on the left-hand side, they produce the dynamic data, and then if I have queries that need the very freshest data, what am I going to do? I have to wait until ETL brings them over, but until then there will be more fresh data. So I never get fresh data. So in the end, I have transactions um, that are very fast and they change the data and I have queries that are longer running and they don't change the data. But now I need the freshness as well. So the new kinds of systems that deal with this are called hybrid transactional analytical systems and they're not scientifically very challenging. I mean, you just take the transactional load and you take the query load and you make them run on top of the same database. So you don't have two copies of the data. So you run the transactions and the queries. You run essentially the queries on the transactional side. That's what you do, okay? But that creates all sorts of problems. First of all, how are you gonna schedule them, right? Think of the queries are huge, they're like trucks and transactions are like motorcycles, very fast and small. And there's different ways to schedule the work, okay? So on the left-hand side, we have the classical ETL. So think of a data center, and these are two different servers. 
And the um, one server is running the, the transactional side, and the other one is running the analytical side, and their memory subsystems have their respective data. And that's the classical way. The other way is to revolutionize everything and make all of the data center servers run all of the queries and transactions. So you can localize transactions and queries on the same data to the same server. Do you see how that's very good? Because the, the queries are going to get the fresh data. They don't have to wait for the data to go on the other side. So here we have data that's stored at this level. And you have the queries and the transactions about that data running on the same server. OK? This is the classical, where the data has to go on the other side to run queries on. Yeah. So what's the problem here? This is great, right? Fresh data, queries on fresh data. The problem is interference. The problem is this, is, is right here, right? The problem is that when you have motorcycles and trucks in the same road, they're gonna interfere with each other. And interference in the road might be feasible to do in real time to fix, right? Interference in systems means that the transactions are going to be kicking the data of the queries out of the caches and memory, and the queries are going to be kicking the data of the transactions out of the memory, which means that either one side or the other side, or more often both sides, are going to be much slower than if you had done this and tolerated less fresh data. There's a classical trade-off between data freshness and interference. So, our work, and I'm not going to give you too many details, is about doing real-time scheduling and at the same time real-time snapshotting, because you have consistency problems, right, between data that comes from transactions and the transactional load and the query load, and exploring alternatives, namely sending data not ETL, but sending data through our DNA, for example, to the query side in real time as needed, depending on the data freshness needs of each query, or doing elastic compute, which means sending queries over to the transactional side, scheduling them in real time so that they take advantage of fresh data, again, according to freshness. How are we doing? Are you ready for the hard work? <laughs> this, is a, this is a real, I mean, it, we think that this philosophy is very much needed to go to the next era of, of systems. And you can't do anything unless you pay attention to the hard work. I know that's like, you know, huge distances from what you guys do, and trust me, I'm not very enamorated with hardware either. But I'm going to let you in a few secrets here, um, because hardware has been evolving, and people in computer architecture have been trying really hard to keep the computer microarchitecture. Microarchitecture is how we build the compute and memory devices. Make them both handy and cheap and small and general purpose. It's not easy. One of the principal ways, if you look at the evolution of hardware, one of the principal ways they've been using to do that is through different levels of parallelism. Some of you might have heard all of these uh, three-letter abbreviations, TLAs, right? MLP, TLP, CMP, chip multiprocessor, mul uh, 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 memory level parallelism, thread level parallelism, instruction level parallelism, right? All this has come, you know, with the end of the Denard scaling, we have tube multiprocessors here, we have multiple chip, multiple processors, we call them cores, on the same chip, and we throw the ball to the software to figure out how to parallelize across all this. Everybody is aware of this evolution. Your phones have way more cores than any computer in the 80s has ever dreamt of. So, Today, we have what my former student Brian Johnson calls Franklin chips, which is basically chips that have totally different compute elements in them across the board in the same chip and from the computer next to them, which creates a huge problem 
right? I've always worked on hardcore conscious uh, algorithms. I've, I've always thought that my algorithms should pay attention to what the hardware offers and should be hardware conscious, okay? And hardware conscious means that I look at my computer, I see what it has in it, and then I write software which takes advantage of the, of the resources in the hardware. Okay, and that's hardware conscious. What do I get with hardware conscious? I get excellent performance. What if I'm trying to take the software and run it to another computer? It's not portable. Or if it's portable, it's going to be very slow because it assumes different hardware. Similarly, if I don't write hardware conscious code, I write hardware oblivious code, then I get less good performance than if I had written hardware conscious code, but my code runs everywhere the same. So I have predictability, which is always good, right? So, how, so our game here and our work in this level is moving toward creating, instead of writing code ahead of time, assuming that I'm going to be running on GPUs or on CPUs, I'm going to be code generating the part that's specific to the hardware, okay? And I'm just going to give you the very high level view of how we do that. Here's a little query. This is a query that says, I'm going to take the sum of all the numbers in column A from a table T, where another column B, the values are more than 42. So for every tuple that the values are more than 42, I'm going to sum up column A. Okay, so this logical plan says I'm going to first scan the table, then I'm going to filter for B more than 42, and then I'm going to be aggregate. I'm going to aggregate all the values, I'm going to do the sum. Aggregate means the sum. Is that clear to everybody? It's the simplest possible query plan that you can have. So for this query plan, I want to be able to run each of these little parts here, wherever it finds itself. I want to be able to run the scan, either on the GPU or on the CPU, wherever I have availability on the chip. So maybe I have 16 GPUs on the chip and four CPUs. I want to, and maybe I have more threads on this GPU, which I do. Only, but I need different code at the low level for each one of these devices. So how can I do this in real time, right? The way to do this in real time is, and, and also, sorry, if I have 16 GPUs, I want to be able to parallelize this thing and have 16 little scans, okay? And, run, and take advantage of all of my hardware because I paid for it, okay? So I need three dimensions, okay? The first dimension, is within every operator. Operator is that little, is this little round thing here. This is an operator, okay? So the first dimension here is within an operator to be able to follow the right logic and take advantage of the device at the high level. Know, for example, that the threads are one in a GPU, there are thousands, uh, in a CPU, there are thousands in the GPU. Then for intra-device or interoperator, if you will, I want to do the correct mappings to the memory subsystem of each of these devices because the CPU has a different memory hierarchy, has a different cache hierarchy with different principles of accessing than a GPU. And I want to be conscious to that. So there I co-generate the right mappings at the last minute. An inter-device means I want to recognize the fact that sometimes I will need to re reunite all of this data, which means I need some control that will take the computation from a, a GPU and will move it back to the CPU to bring all the results back together. So these three dimensions of abstraction allow us to implement what we call accelerator-level parallelism and essentially take this logical plan create new operators that we infuse in the logical plan that, you see this simple logical plan became this monster here, which can port it to two different ones, can, can do operators on the GPU side then on the CPU at the same time and bring it back together. You see you have control transfer operators here, 
you have segmenting operators here, memory move operators. These are not the logic of the query. These are actually there to implement those three little dimensions that, that, uh, that I talked to you about. And then this, you take one of these very cute compilers that do um, a code generation, and you create them into different pipelines for divide, scrolling, and all that, and then you can run them through code-generated parts of the pipelines to all the, 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 comp the computational elements that you have in the system. And then putting these two together to run hybrid transactional analytical processing on heterogeneous hardware, you run the analytics on the GPUs, you run the transactions on the CPUs, you move analytics to the transactional side if it's more efficient for DRAM, and depending on what kind of interconnect you have between main memory and GPUs, you can do different things with how you move the snapshots around so that you have consistent um, execution. So with this little last bit here, not only could we hide the heterogeneity at the data level, we also hide it at the hardware level. I just have the outlook to the future here. The complexity of the workload is only becoming more. People download code snippets from libraries around the internet and they use them as parts of their own systems without even looking at the code. There's so much out there. There's more every day, okay? Data pipelines, which is something we are working on but I didn't talk about, are extremely um, complex. Okay, and you need these kinds of principles also for data pipelines. Uh, because, for example, when you run a data pipeline with 200 different levels, and you do a lot of work twice or three times, so you need to be able to detect that to make the pipelines more efficient. So we need systems that can learn new functionality in real time. Good news is that all of this work that I presented and also all the work in the area, in the community, Although it's for one system, I never talked about more than one system, so more data centers, today it's applicable for scale out as well, for rack scale as well as it is applicable for scale up. Because the link between servers today is of comparable speed to the link between, say, a GPU and the CPU. So it's like you have one system on the rack, as opposed to multiple systems connected with slow network links. The network isn't a surprise anymore. So we have a, 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 a public domain code that does all this and some more stuff. It's called Proteus, ProteusDB.com. And with this, I want to say that with my team, my dream is to not build intelligent real-time systems, to not hard code the intelligence from ahead of time into the systems, to build street smart systems. Systems that can start, can, mathema can, can mathematically define things, because mathematics is really the only language that doesn't have limits, all the other languages do. And then, this way, they apply intelligence in real time, they invent intelligent ways to execute the system in real time, and change becomes a first class citizen and dynamic stuff becomes a first class citizen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anita, for this great talk. Yeah, and it's a great overview also for people who are a bit uh, further away from your delay. Thank you very much. Thanks. I hope it was understandable. So, yeah, yeah, but I'm happy to answer questions. Please ask questions, everybody, if you have any. Yeah, thanks for this inspiring talk, talk and presentation. Yeah, um, my question would be um, to slide number 16, where you have this, uh, these episodes. Um, my question is actually, do these episodes have to be 
um, independent or, or uh, from their data distribution, does it matter if the data distribution varies from episode to episode? And do you have to ensure that maybe if the data comes in from a stream, then you have no control over the distribution, and then you maybe would have to, to track if uh, the, the, um, uh, the data distribution changes, so you have a change point detection problem, or maybe they come from a sampling, so that's actually a question. So this is a fantastic question, okay, and it's actually the first question I, <laughs> we, we were asking ourselves when this worked and everybody was so happy. It turns out two things. One is that the data distribution, um, so the answer is if you want to do this fast, um, the distribution will matter, but it will be taken into account through the reinforcement learning. So we use a variant of Q-learning, and it, 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 it learns with the data distribution, if you will. We don't take it into account, because if we do, we end up query optimizing, okay? And it's going to take a longer time. However, uh, as you mentioned, my wet dream is really to, to, to do something for streams as well. And we have a paper in VLDB 23, it was actually just got accepted, where we, do, we would do uh, partitioning um, in real time, partitioning of multiple streams. So I'm trying to, I'm going to be trying now to marry these two um, for the partitioning to, because partition is extremely important in streams, right? Because you have to, a stream, you need to partition all that. So I find these two to be two dimensions, two sides of the same coin essentially, because after you've partitioned your stream, you can do this thing for every, for every substream, right? So, um, and then you can do, in my mind, so I'm thinking and talking here, you can do um, real-time, um, essentially, uh, roulette, this system. You can do this learning thing real-time on a per-partition basis. And if you are careful so that as to maintain, not uniform, but predictable um, distribution, Per partition, then you might be able to accelerate this um, even further and make it better. Because the game here isn't played in the qu the quality of the of the plan is going to be great. The question is how fast you get to the really fast plan. The other thing that that I thought of and, and thinking about with your question is that if the distribution starts uniform, then becomes uh, something else and becomes something, then maybe it's a good thing to learn that and then learn the other thing and then learn the other thing, especially for streams, but also for very large inputs. So, you know, it's not black and white that you should know ahead of time, right? Good, because we don't. <laughs> uh, there was a question, you had another question, maybe? Or no? Okay, I thought. Further questions? Um, I was intrigued by what you were talking about before you got to hop the hardware about the idea of essentially getting the, using the heterogeneous data sources and pulling the data when it's time to do the query and you kind of took out the, the DNS side from the middle. Um, my main question is what exactly are you caching when you use using caches? Because you can't be caching the data itself or else it would constantly be invalidated. So, so what exactly do you cache to make this work better over time? Um, so thank you. Uh, the, so the, the, in the beginning, we cache a lot of things, a lot of different things. Um, the cache is composed by positional caches, which essentially have, a, think of them as bitmaps, but they're positions, they're not values. So where was the interesting data in the CSV as opposed to what it was? It's like, you know, you don't take a picture of the restaurant, you write down the address. Maybe it will change, you know, the, in the, so you go back to the same address to find the data. That helps with updates a lot because in this world that I live in, I don't own the data, so updates will happen in spite of my system, okay? So I will not know whether something has been updated or not, and if I cache the value, I will have cached another a value that I, 
Now, at a lot of times, that said, so mostly positions, a lot of times we actually do cash some values uh, or some derived values, but they are, they, they are largely dependent on the query and on the format of the data. And so for every query, for every different data, for every different transformation or aggregate, we cache totally different kinds of stuff. And we cache code, generated code. So as to save the time to regenerate it for the same. But the code, but you know, one thing to note here, and this is a great question, I can take advantage of it to say, one thing to note here is that this system that I just generated here can only run one query on this data. It cannot do anything else. So I have code, at the end of this, I have code that can only run this one query. It's like, a, it's like creating a custom database system for yourself, right? So, and what's that? For each query. Then the next query that comes in will enrich this system and it will make it able to run two queries. And then it will be able to run three queries. What was really nice is that eventually you're able to run exclusively from the caches because there's very strong locality in each um, in, in query streams, very strong locality. And so, yeah. Other questions? So I have always one. Um, very impressive, and I think it's really the way to go. <laughs> Kind of uh, getting away of starting a cult. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I also think it's still a long way uh, in the sense that uh, oh, the examples you showed are quite specific SQL queries for a quite simple analysis tasks. When it comes to um, yeah pipelines and this, you had only a few to uh, work that like complex analytics pipelines or even involving some deep learning algorithms and some standard algorithms and whatever data cleaning algorithms. Um, how, uh, what do you think, how, how long will it take uh, to run all of this in your philosophy? So what our current dimensions are here, okay? Our current dimensions are data, hardware, workload, which I talked about. Overlap, which I kind of talked about. This is the paper that um, Christian had an, a question about. So for data, we are um, doing what I said for hardware. We're doing this um, just in time code generation. For here, we do, you know, execute, re-optimize, execute, re-optimize, right? For workload, we have all of these scheduling options across machines, across um, devices for different, for HTAP systems. Here are the pipelines. The pipelines, so we had a paper um, uh, in CIDR 2022, it was this year, um, I'm losing it, in CIDR 2022, where we actually um, have this example of a pipeline that's composed by multiple scripts. Here, for example, you need to, to, to serialize to move the binary data from here to here. And you will do it. You know what you'll do it? Because this programmer and this programmer are two different people and they code defensively. And you will never be able to stop that, okay? But what you can do is create, it's work with the compiler. So when the problem is horizontal, we wanna think vertical. When the problem is vertical, we wanna think general generality, horizontal. So this could be a good way to, to, to show new dimensions. So here, think vertical and say, what does defense in programming mean? Defense in programming means that I, draw, I, I drive a, a, a barrier here. And this guy doesn't know what this guy is doing. So it's going to serialize. And the first thing range is going to do is going to deserialize. So how stupid is this? Binary files are anonymous. So what you want to do is use compiler tools, right, to essentially blur the boundaries in such a way so as to separate the, 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 the um, uh, maintain the separation of concerns and the modularity at the programming level, and then at the compiler level, 
allow for the work to only happen once. Um, the, it's, not, it's not too, I mean, we have created a few um, um, ways to do this. It's not super general yet, but we're basically attacking it from the um, language point of view. I'm working with Martin Nodersky. He's the creator of Scala. Who has heard of Scala? Okay, a good number of people. This is the most common functional language, right? And, and Martin and I are co-advising a student, Nana Herlihy, who is actually working on this. And she wrote the paper for, for CIDR this year in, the, in January, it was published, to, to do this. And now we're working on a new paper for this, yeah. So that's what we're doing here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming.